today on Mother Mayhem. But odds are, yes, the way you were raised, the way you were considered as a kid, the way your needs were met, the way you were treated, how your needs got met, didn't get met, how you were spoken to, how you were given affection or not given affection, absolutely impacts how you show up in the world for other people and with other people today. Welcome back to Mother Mayhem, a narcissistic abuse recovery podcast for daughters. Hi, I'm your host, Heather Gray, and I'm so glad you're continuing this conversation with me. Last week, we dug a little bit deeper into how do you have a better relationship with yourself. And in that episode, we acknowledged that after a childhood filled with focus on your mom, on what her needs were, her responses might be, and how she might interact with you, it was really hard for you as a kid to develop your relationship with yourself. And so as an adult, it often leads to struggle and challenges. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, I really do encourage you to go back and listen to that episode first before diving into the episode we have today, because today we're digging into a conversation about your relationships with other people understanding why relationships with other people can be a bit of a struggle for you, but also how do you begin to start to understand ways that you can move through the world differently so that you can start to have a better relationship with other people. And it's my bias and my belief that until you have a better relationship with yourself and are aware of your relationship with yourself, it's really impossible to have a healthy relationship with other people people do it all the time, right? We get disconnected from ourselves. We don't always know ourselves or what we're thinking or feeling in in any particular moment. We certainly don't know and hold that awareness 24 seven. But if you haven't checked in with yourself in a while and you haven't gotten clear with yourself on how you move through the world, what your needs and preferences are, how your particular experiences with your mom, in addition to other experiences that you've had in life, have impacted you and how you think about yourself, feel about yourself and consider yourself, you're really going to have a hard time understanding who you are and how you operate and move through the world in your other relationships with other people. I was very deliberate in the order of which we're talking about this because I'm trying to frame out narcissistic abuse recovery for you in a way that's approachable, not too overwhelming and gives you a guide in case you're using this podcast as a self-study course for yourself. That being said, today's focus is going to be on relationships. And the most important thing that I can do in this conversation is help you understand how your trauma has impacted your ability to connect with and have relationships with other people. Oftentimes, we're not so conscious about those things. We don't know how our early childhood experiences impact how we show up with our friends, with our coworkers, with our neighbors, with casual people that we just see in the store. And we certainly aren't aware of how our relationships with our closer people, romantic relationships, our partnerships are affected. And it's really kind of my story and my belief that a lot of people don't even realize that they're childhood trauma and the relationship with their mom is showing up in their romantic relationships today because it doesn't feel like an automatic leap. And a lot of times too, I think you guys have to give yourself some credit too, because I don't think that anyone's coming to the show having not considered this before, having not done any amount of work on themselves, not having read any sort of self-help book or gone down the rabbit hole of why relationships feel particularly vulnerable or why you haven't been successful in relationships. It's my story that that's a conversation that brought you to this show. Recognizing that this stuff is hard for you, you haven't quite wrapped your mind around it and you're looking for some organization. So that's why I, again, I think the first step to having a better relationship with someone else is to have a better relationship with yourself. And that's why I'm urging you to go back and listen to that last episode if you haven't already. And then to continue the conversation and to really dive deeper into this, 
I think the most important thing I can lead with is helping you understand the role of trauma in relationships. And again, this is one of those conversations where I'm going to be getting a bit clinical with all of you. And it sounds perhaps a little bit like psychobabble run amok because usually, you know, I'm a therapist. I work with people all the time. I've been doing this for a number of years now. And a lot of times I've run a teletherapy practice now, but a lot of times when I used to run an in-person practice, people would like sit on the couch and be like, are you about to tell me that my mother is the reason for all my problems? And it was always kind of that like, you know, sort of stereotypical joke about going to therapy. And I usually had to answer seriously and say, well, we don't know that yet. It might've been your father, <laughs> but odds are, yes, the way you were raised the way you were considered as a kid, the way your needs were met, the way you were treated, how your needs got met, didn't get met, how you were spoken to, how you were given affection or not given affection absolutely impacts how you show up in the world for other people and with other people today. Non-trauma informed brains. So somebody who wasn't raised by a narcissistic mother somebody who was raised in a secure, loving relationship with an adult figure, because it's not always biological, right? So I want to I wanna respect those relationships as well. But when you're raised in your childhood with secure attachment to adults who listen to you, who get your basic needs met, who tend to your emotional needs, and who let you feel safe in the world, your brain is going to operate on autopilot and brains that are not haven't been trauma informed haven't been impacted by trauma are wired for connection what that means is that you if you hadn't been traumatized by your childhood and hadn't had such a disruptive relationship with your mom connecting with other people would be easier for you because you would be moving through the world with a general belief awareness of or understanding that the world is safe for you that you can get your need met, you can say something that's bothering you, somebody will listen, tend to it, a sure understanding, and make sure you get that need. Because that wasn't your experience in childhood, and it was consistently not your experience, because again, parents mess it up all the time, right? They have an off day, they lose their patience, they have tantrums of their own. We're not talking about it when a parent has had an off day. We're talking about it when a parent never had a particularly good day or a right day, never really consistently showed up for you in a way that felt safe and secure. So when those disruptions happen for yourself and when you're being raised in that way, your brain is going to be wired for protection. You're not going to have this feeling of moving through the world and a belief in a story that your needs are going to get met that somebody's there to take care of you, that you're not too much and that it's all okay. Instead, you're going to be more wired for potential abandonment, for potential naming, shaming, blaming, to be pushed away versus pulled closer. Your experience in your childhood of having your mom always come first and your mom always running the show leads you to believe that your needs don't matter, that your opinions don't matter, and everything about you comes second to whoever else you're in a relationship with. And what that ends up creating for your brain and your experience is a trauma response that leads you to be more wired for protection. So somebody who has a secure attachment with their parent is going to be wanting to seek out other people, talk to other people. You moving through the world with your experience, you're going to be more wired to be more cautious, to be more hesitant, to say, you just asked how I was feeling, but do you really want to know how I'm feeling? And even if you asked, and even if I believe you that I asked, is any answer that I give okay? Or do you want to just only hear that I'm fine or that everything worked out in the end? Am I really allowed to show up unapologetically, authentically as me and be seen and believed and validated? You don't walk through the world with that truth. You walk through the world with the truth that my needs aren't going to get met. I may not get validated. So as a result, you end up armoring up in relationships. 
you're not moving closer to people, you're moving further away. You might be more hyper vigilant and aware of disconnects and the ways your friends or your partners move closer to you or move further away. And you may feel that response in your body. And it may be really intense because you don't trust what's going to happen next. Your brain responds to perceived change or to perceived distance and goes into fight, flight, or freeze mode. So when you are in fight, flight, or freeze, you're not wired for connection. You're not tuned in to clear communication, showing up as you are, having somebody believe you. You are wired to swallow your feelings, to not talk about yourself, to not have preferences, to not sort of acknowledge your needs. That ends up happening for you on repeat in so many of your different relationships. Your experience as you move through the world is largely wired for protection. What we want to help you do is understand that because again, in previous episodes, I've walked you through how trauma has impacted your brain and it's kind of like that faulty car alarm. It's telling you in any new situation, someone could be risky. Somebody might hurt you. Somebody might not be true to you. Somebody might not be loyal. Somebody might change their mind about you. Your brain is going to create all kinds of stories. These stories keep you isolated, have you more reserved, pull back, not share, not emote, not connect. And what we want to help you do is get in charge of that alarm a little bit so you can learn to say to your body, hey, I've met this person. She has been consistently kind to me. She's always aware of me. She got me a cup of coffee. I think she's a really good coworker. She seems to care about me. I don't think I have to worry every second of every day that if I look away, she might screw me over or try to take credit for my work or my idea. She seems to consistently be respectful and kind. And I can say, thank you, body. Thank you, alarm clock. I see you. I see you're trying to take care of me, but I've got this and I'm okay. When it comes to understanding the role that trauma has had on your ability to have successful, connected, bonded relationships with other people, it's really important that you also consider the role of attachment. And I think that one of the things that you would probably come across at some point in time down your self-development journey, your personal development journey, and your own exploration of relationship issues is the idea that there's these four attachment styles, the ways people based on how they were born, genetics, history, culture, there's a lot of things that can impact our way of connecting with other people. And the way it's sort of described a little bit is that like, what are our natural instincts? If we are given no information other than what's in front of us, what is our natural inclination and our more natural response intended to be? Because once we become intentional about relationships and once we become deliberate about relationships, we can know what our instincts are or what our natural born attachment style might be but we can be more conscientious about how we show up in a relationship despite those tendencies. But when we're first showing up and connecting with people or we're first beginning to explore this with ourselves, we don't always know. And these terms are thrown out and we see them on social media. We see them in self-help books or a therapist might throw them out, but we don't always know what they mean for us. And I think it's really important to sort of, in this part of the conversation, share with you a little bit of my bias about attachment theory and attachment styles. I, like any therapist, went to school, took the class, had the conversations, passed the test, got the license, did all the things necessary to learn about attachment styles. It was taught to all, all of us. In order to be a good therapist, we have to go to good attachment theory school. But when I look back on what I learned and when I look back on the conversations that I had back in the late 90s when I was in college, the attachment conversation doesn't automatically encourage or connect to the role of trauma and how childhood trauma impacts attachment styles. There's a lot of more recent research about it. But when you see things on social media and you see things that are portrayed about attachment styles, I don't always see the role of childhood trauma in those conversations. 
And it's my bias that that's an irresponsible way to have the conversation, that if we just pretend that trauma doesn't exist, then we're ignoring the reasons for most of these attachment styles and why they show up in the world. When I'm talking attachment style, I want to include the idea of trauma. And so the first thing that you will hear about is a secure attachment. You heard me reference it earlier in the show. People who are securely attached know that their needs are going to get met, know that they can move through the world in any certain way, and they're going to be seen, accepted, and respected. If somebody disrespects them, they're not automatically going to jump on the bandwagon that they were betrayed. They might have more room and breadth of scope to be able to connect with someone, to go back, to follow up, and have the conversation. But people who are not securely attached will be besieged with self-doubt, will find the inner critic is ramped up and ready to go and insecurely attached person will be armored up and ready in that fight flight or freeze response to show up in any particular way depending on how they perceive the situation i would change securely attached to trauma-free upbringing if you will and i would also say that we can become securely attached with partners and friends and co-workers with trauma-informed relationships so that you can develop close relationships, secure relationships with other people, even if you've experienced trauma, because you can build with other people who are open to and willing to build on this conversation with you. They can together with you build a trauma informed relationship. And when I say that, and I'm going to go into this more in a little bit at the end of the episode. But when I say that, I'm talking about you being aware of how you move through the world, understanding that you have trauma responses that sometimes get triggered when you interact with other people and you start talking about that with people and you start sharing that and start opening up with people about that experience, about how you move through the world, the things you think about when conversations get tense or when there's anticipated conflict and you're able to say to somebody, hey, you know, I know this isn't your fault. I know this isn't what you're bringing to the table, but sometimes I get super anxious in relationships because I worry that somebody's going to leave me or somebody's going to change their mind about me. And as a result, it would be really helpful if you A, B, and C. And that's why I went into some of that stuff with you last week in the last episode around building a better relationship with yourself. Because in order to build a better relationship with other people around what you need and what your preferences are and what feels safe to you, you need to know those things so you can communicate them to other people. A securely attached relationship is either one that was not impacted by trauma or a relationship that has been trauma informed. And if you can wrap your head around that, I think that my guess is some of you who have come to this show feeling a little bit hopeless about your ability to show up in relationship with other people, feel kind of stuck in the kinds of relationships you've had or limited in the types of friendships you've had. I'm hoping that as I talk about this more and get into it a little bit deeper and unpack it, you'll be able to see where you can start to be and feel more success inside of your own relationships. One of the things you'll hear a lot about in attachment theory is avoidant attachment, anxious attachment, fearful attachment, or secure attachment. We just walk through secure attachment. I think it's fair that we go and we dive in and help you understand both avoidant attachment, anxious attachment, and also the one that some people call disorganized, other people call fearful. I like the phrase disorganized because it's kind of a blend of everything. It's a little bit anxious attachment. It's a little bit avoidant attachment. And I would also argue that there's some secure attachment experiences in that as well. If we're telling you that you're avoidant or you're acknowledging yourself as an avoidant attachment style, as having an attach an avoidant attachment style, it's easy to just think of yourself as walled up, guarded, and that you hold your cards close to your chest. And that's probably what it looks like to other people, and that's probably how other people experience you. But what I want to help you understand in this conversation is that people who are avoidantly attached stay safe by putting their feelings away and staying away. 
So they are pulling back from relationships. They are increasing the amount of solo time they have. They are holding intimacy at bay, not because they don't care about the person, not because they don't want that relationship for themselves, but because they go away and they go by themselves to reset. Sometimes introverts relate a lot to avoidant attachment styles. Sometimes they think they're avoidantly attached because they get their energy by being alone. The way to understand this differently is that somebody can be introverted and in a close relationship and not feel as though they have to maintain equilibrium with themselves by going away. They just need to get energy for themselves by going away. An avoidant personality is going to feel an imbalance is going to feel an increase in anxiety, an increase in tension, a lack of equilibrium when they are attempting closer relationships with other people because they go away to reset. And a lot of times when avoidant people are managing themselves, the thing that they're doing is they're locking away their feelings and they're staying in their thoughts. Because if your mom didn't listen to you, didn't care about your feelings, didn't wonder whether or not you were having a good day, a bad day, or an in-between day, or if you were mocked for having difficult feelings about a relatively normal day, you're not going to know what to share. So you're going to be in relationship in your present day. You're going to feel your body react with tension. You probably won't even know what words get attached to it. You're just going to feel the tension in your body. You're going to feel the energy in your body. And it's going to tell you to get away, to move away, to distance, so you can put whatever you're thinking and feeling on lockdown. Somebody who runs anxious is kind of the opposite. They stay safe in relationship by reaching for and pleading for understanding and connection. So they have this intense desire to be seen, heard, acknowledged, and validated. They want to connect with you. They want to talk to you. They want to ask questions. They want to wrap themselves up in their feelings and feel all their feelings. If you're somebody who is an anxious attacher, you are going to be somebody who feels safest when you're close to the person you're looking to build a relationship with, improve a relationship with, or have a relationship with. Distance will create anxiety because being near the person creates a touchstone of security and reassures you that the person isn't going anywhere, that you are still loved and that you are still bonded and you are still connected. For you, when you have that alone time, you are not going to be feeling safe instinctively. It is going to make you wonder where you stand, perhaps. It's going to make you feel threatened. It's going to make you feel vulnerable. Over time, when you're aware that that's how you experience other people, again, you can start to understand what are the behaviors that other people choose? How are other people showing up in the world that are, is making me feel or respond in this way? And what is the evidence of that? So right now I'm telling myself a story. My partner got busy with work for three days and I barely heard from him. And that must mean that like somebody at work has his attention or he care, he's finding somebody who's more interesting than me to talk to. Our relationship has grown stale for him. We're going to create all kinds of negative stories in that silence. Whereas an avoidant attached person is going to fill silence with stories. It's kind of two sides of the same coin. Anxious people are going to push themselves forward. Avoidant people are going to pull themselves back and hold their cards a little bit closer to their chest. Then we have fearful or disorganized attached folks. And those of you who are listening to this would probably say what I say, that I think we're all a little bit disorganized in our attachment, that like it's pretty rare for somebody to be totally avoidantly attached or completely 100% anxiously attached. More often than not, we say, ah, we're a little bit of both. Sometimes we'll hear something or somebody will look at us a certain way and it's going to have us pull back. Other times we're going to be filled with so much joy and connection inside a relationship. We're going to want to immerse ourselves in our relationship and we're going to want to run toward that relationship. And it can sometimes feel like that all or nothing inside a relationship. And what's important to recognize is that that feeling of disorganized attachment a lot of times for people who move through the world in that way, and I would argue that that's going to be most of you who are listening to this show, 
it's this push pull. I love you. I need you. I'm enjoying this so much. I'm so scared that I love you. I'm so nervous that I've come to need you. I'm so nervous. I'm going to lose this because I've come to enjoy this so much. So what happens for people who have this disorganized attachment style, trauma is hard for you. It impacts your brain. It makes you want to withhold. It makes you want to withdraw and wall up. But also too, safety feels really hard because safety becomes vulnerable. Safety becomes the thing that sort of looks like happiness, looks like getting all of your needs met and finding a person and suddenly for people, that kind of safety feels so vulnerable because you've come to care about something and that means you could lose it. What we're working for in building and improving our ability to connect with relationships is understanding what our instinct is. What is that first story we tell ourselves? And then we can start to look at the evidence that supports that story and start to say, I know I'm fearing abandonment right now. I know I'm fearing that like I'm having such a good time and it's just going to go away. But what's the evidence? What am I seeing? Is the person in front of me, do they have a history of letting me down? Have they said these things before and not followed through? What evidence do I have to back up my story? Because a lot of times when we're not intentional, and we don't have that relationship with ourselves and that connection to how we're perceiving things and the stories we're telling ourselves, we run with those gut instincts and those narratives as if they're true. You're going to hurt me. You're going to leave me. You're going to change my your mind about me. Nobody likes me. I'm unlovable. I, you know, people are only in relationship with me because they can use me. People are only in relationship with me because I meet their needs and I'm such a giver. And as soon as I stop giving and think about myself for 10 seconds, they're going to lose interest in me. Those are the stories that anxiously attach people, avoidantly attach people, and disorganized or fearful attached people are going to create. When you decide for yourself that you want to be more securely attached and you want more trauma-informed relationships, you are going to feel safe by acknowledging your hurt, being curious about the other person's hurt, and being open to learning yourself and the other person and how you're responding to each other, and then identify ways that you would prefer to interact with that person and connect with that person going forward. Attachment is a whole long conversation. And I have a feeling the way it's going to work on this show, because I'm not looking to give you this deep dive multi-week episode arc on attachment. There's so much information out there. I want you to consider this part of the conversation a prompt for you to consider yourself and to explore where you relate. And again, odds are you're going to find yourself in that disorganized, fearful state where you're a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But going forward in all of the episodes, we're always going to be talking about relationships. We're always going to be talking about how you connect to yourself, how you connect to other people, how you respond to the world, how your body is interacting with the world and responding to the world. This isn't the first time we're having this conversation. This isn't your first rodeo with this conversation, but I wanted to put it on the table for your consideration because then when I reference it in future conversations and future episodes, you know what we're talking about. If we're looking at our role in relationships, we do want to consider trauma and we do want to consider attachment. But we also want to look at how trauma has impacted what I call our picker. <laughs> a lot of people who come to me and talk to me about their relationship struggles, they just feel like their picker is broken. That the people that they welcome into their lives never really like them, never stay, only stay if there's something that they can do for them. But that they don't experience the people in their lives as people who will consistently choose them. The one thing a lot of you want more than anything, and again, we Shonda Rhimes, I think, gets a lot of money for this phrase, but a person, right? Meredith picked Christina, and Christina was her person on Grey's Anatomy. Everybody's looking for their person. Everybody wants their person. And when they look at, why haven't I met my person? Why don't I have a best friend? Or why don't I have a partner that's like other people? 
It's my picker is broken. What is wrong with me? Why do I keep choosing people who don't take care of me? Why do I keep choosing people who put me down, who make me feel bad, who love bomb me and they get super, super close to me and they shower me with attention, affection, and then quickly change their mind? Why does that keep happening? We want to have this relationship conversation with you by informing your picker a little bit better going forward. If you were to tell me coming into this episode that you have a history of attracting a lot of users and abusers, or you have a history of attracting emotionally distant people, that you aren't familiar with people who actually care about your trauma, who hear that you had this disrupted relationship with your mom and it's impacted you in a couple of ways, and they want to learn more about you and get to know you, that idea and that concept likely feels totally foreign to you. Or maybe you have one or two people in your life who have successfully bonded and connected with you and you have secure relationships and secure attachments with those folks. But that by and large, the people who you've collected along the way in your life replicate patterns and situations that you have experienced with your mom in childhood. And that is not a coincidence and it didn't happen by accident. Oftentimes what will happen is when our needs have not been met by a primary caregiver or an adult, or we haven't had a safe adult in our life to have a strong relationship with or connect with in a way that feels bonded and secure, we are trying to unconsciously change the ending to that story. So what ends up happening is if I can get this emotionally unavailable man or I can get this emotionally unavailable woman to become emotionally available to me, then I can undo the childhood wound and the emotional abandonment that my mother handed me when I was a child. I will start to feel lovable. I will start to see that for real, the problem was never me. But if I keep choosing that person and that person doesn't choose me, that means my mom was right. The other part of this and the other dynamic of this is that we all are sort of magnets for the familiar. So somebody who asks a lot of questions about you and wants to learn and understand your job and know more about you, that is going to feel wildly unfamiliar to you. And you are going to feel way outside your comfort zone with someone who is just genuinely curious about you and wants to know. <laughs> and again, I used the love bombing phrase a couple of minutes ago, but you're like, you, you, you will be skeptical and you'll be like, oh, this person's just love bombing me. They're just giving me tons of affection to get me snared into their web, to get me to like them, to get me to trust them. But as soon as I like them and as soon as I trust them, they're going to lose interest in me. That has nothing to do with these people and everything to do with a broken picker. Because emotionally unavailable people rarely become emotionally available for anyone. They have their own pile of poop that they haven't dealt with. They have their own stories and ways of moving through the world. They have their own phobias around committing in relationships and being securely attached to others. And they have no interest in that bonded, trauma-informed kind of relationship. Those people are not your people. And you are never going to be able to rewrite history or rewrite your trauma or successfully connect with those people. It's not because you've said something wrong or done something wrong or didn't do something or didn't say something. It's entirely about your picker being the magnet for somebody who's not healthy for you and almost repelling you against the people who do want to securely attach to you, who do want a close, intimate relationship with you, or do genuinely want your friendship, your guidance, or your mentorship, or just simply your company. So part of this is looking at who you have chosen and starting to make conscious decisions about choosing people who gravitate toward a more emotionally connected, trauma-informed relationship. A lot of people, I can almost see all of you rolling your eyes right now as you listen to this episode and, and, and hear me say that because you think like, no, nobody moves through the world that way. I'm not talking about having to choose people who deep dive and have therapy sessions with you every single time they hang out. I'm talking about people who move through the world with kindness 
and consideration for your experience and your sensitivity and what you bring to the table. They don't have to know all the things and do all the things, but they have to recognize that as a way of you moving through the world the way you have, you have certain sensitivities and they don't want you to be reactive. They don't want you to feel bad. They want you to know you're important. So they take steps and measures to do that. It's kind of the same thing that you'll hear when people talk about love languages. And that's a whole nother episode and a whole nother show. I do think love languages are real. I do think that they're a thing. But again, I think love languages are about being trauma informed because what we need in a relationship and how we experience relationships and how we feel, how we give and receive love, all of that is trauma informed. It's all childhood informed based on whether or not we had secure attachment as kids. Yes, love languages are a thing, but more importantly, we just want to connect with people who are kind, who move through the world in a, with an awareness of others, who if they're not sure what the right thing to do is, they ask because they want to know what the right thing to do is. And if you're with someone who's not showing up in that way, you want to be able to reroute that a little bit. You want to be clear on the type of person you're interested in and the type of person that isn't necessarily good for you and isn't going to take care of your heart and isn't going to consider your feelings. I'm imagining that for some of you, hearing me start the relationship conversation by talking about your trauma or talking about your attachment style probably feels a little bit to you like I'm about to like drop the hammer on you or you're just waiting for me to just get to it already and tell you that you are the, the reason why all your relationships are failing or why relationships are so hard for you or why you get stuck in people pleasing positions or struggle with boundaries. I understand that instinct for it to just be your fault, right? Because if I can tell you it's your fault, then it's something you can fix. And the problem lies with you. You can fix it. You can just show up differently. You can do something differently. But we're talking about relationships here. So that means there's always going to be two people at play, how they're showing up, what they're saying to one another, how they're interacting and responding, because you're not the only one who's gone through some shit, right? We're all interacting with somebody who has their own life before you, who has their own life experiences, their own relationship history. And maybe it wasn't their mother who made them feel unlovable. Maybe it was their dad and maybe it wasn't a narcissistic situation, but they had the love of their life and then the love of the life cheated on them. Or maybe their best friend went off to college and became best friends with someone else and they didn't hear from them again. There are all kinds of reasons why relationships are hard for all of us because we can't just rely on ourselves to solve whatever problem exists. We need the other person to show up. So it's important that we choose people who want to show up and who are interested in that level of connection. And if you're not interested in that level of connection, totally cool, totally fine. But you got to identify for yourself what kind of relationships you do want, what kind of connections you do want. It doesn't have to be totally trauma-informed, but when you're reacting to somebody changing their mind about wanting to hang out on Saturday and they prefer to see you on Sunday instead, you're going to know have to know how to calm your body the heck down if you find that particularly triggering. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about recognizing that, like connecting with people and interacting with people just sends the flares up in our body. And as a result, we have to be aware of them. And that quick little example I gave you of somebody changing their mind, if you had rock solid plans with someone who you're only just coming to know and you had a whole Saturday planned and they suddenly say, hey, my mom's coming to town. Could we just switch Saturday for Sunday? Do you happen to be free? Or could we maybe just do the same thing next week again? My mom's never in town and I'd really like to see her. Well, that's a reasonable request. Even if plans have been made, even if they've long since been established, it's reasonable for somebody to say, hey, when I made this plan with you, I didn't know that my mom was going to come to town. I didn't know that I was going to have this other opportunity. I would like to have a way of doing both, of seeing my mom and spending time with you. Would it be okay if we switched? That is a reasonable ask and they get to ask. 
But your trauma brain, particularly your trauma brain, if it's been triggered by hearing that you have been sort of picked over, looked over, or put off in favor of someone else's mother, that is going to trigger all kinds of shit in you. You're going to be insecure. You're going to second guess yourself. Maybe you're going to get jealous that this person has a relationship with their mom that's better than the relationship with yours because you would never want to drop plans with someone else in favor of your mom. Or maybe you would feel pressured to drop plans because of your mom and resent the other person for being able to have that kind of flexibility and ease in the conversation. Our behaviors and how we show up absolutely are trauma-informed and they're experience-informed. And is every one of our experiences trauma? No, just in the same way that every selfish person is not a narcissist. Some people are just selfish. It doesn't make them a narcissist. We're talking about people who have ingrained patterns of moving through the world in such a way that will consistently exclude you and consistently leave you out of the equation. When you think about relationships and you try to understand them and how you're showing up in them, it is important to know about your trauma, know about your attachment style, be aware of what you bring to the table, particularly what you want in a relationship and the kind of relationship you want, but also to be aware of your behaviors and your reactions inside of relationships. If you know you do that push-pull thing that you bring someone close and then you push them away or you enjoy seeing them on a Friday and on a Saturday, but then by Sunday you need distance, it's important that you know that and accept that a little bit about yourself because what happens more often than not is somebody says, oh, why am I not interested in this kind of close bond with somebody? Why don't I want that? Other people seem to want that. There's something wrong with me. And then you go into that inner critic tape of like, why can't I successfully connect? Rather than recognizing the way you connect naturally and instinctively means that you require a little bit more space. There isn't anything wrong with you. But if you know you have a sensitivity to when plans change, or you know you have a sensitivity to being second or coming in second, and you're able to talk to safe, secure people in your life about that, then you will learn to trust other people with your vulnerabilities. So if you know that you're somebody who shoots first and asks questions later when it comes to arguments, or that you're conflict avoidant, or you prefer not to talk about hard things, or when someone gives you feedback and says that they that you hurt their feelings, feels like the world is over and it makes you feel incredibly defensive and shame-filled because you're not used to being called out in that way, or you are used to being called out that way by someone like your mom, who then became super restrictive of her affection and care for you as a result, you're going to carry that awareness into your reaction with people. It's going to be what's informing how you respond to the relationship in front of you. So when you think about why relationships are difficult for you, I do think it's important to have the conversation with yourself about the behaviors you show up that you have in relationship. But the other thing that I would encourage you to think about here as we talk about this is remember what I just said earlier about your picker. If you are being withdrawn, if you were being hesitant to share, if you were holding the cards close to your chest, might it be about your attachment style? Sure, I'll bite at that. Might it be about your trauma? Of course, it could always be that. That's always going to be on the table. But might it also be because your gut is telling you that this is not a safe person, that this person is emotionally unavailable, this person is not someone capable of sustained intimacy, this is somebody who can only take and receive and never give? Yes, also true. Because you've been around the block around those people, your instincts aren't always going to be something to be ignored, something to write off as trauma. Because if we do that, then we're completely invalidating your experience, your needs, your desires. So that's why that self-awareness piece that I talked about in the last episode is so important. I don't feel like I can trust this person. I'm not going to react and jump as if this person is totally untrustworthy and jump on that as if it's true, but I am going to stop and ask some questions. What about this person is making me feel this way? What about this person is making me think that they may say something to me, but say something different to someone else? Why does this person trigger that reaction in me? What am I sensing? What am I seeing? 
What am I experiencing? What is the evidence? So yes, we want to look at our behaviors. We want to look at how we pull back. We want to look at how we avoid conflict. And we want to ask questions and see if there needs to be a rewiring there or a rewriting of the narrative. But we also want to do that gut check to say, hey, maybe our picker was broken and we are reacting in our body that this person isn't loyal, isn't going to take care of us because this person isn't loyal and isn't going to take care of us. And our gut knows. If you can instead of labeling and judging the behaviors that you have in relationships and the way you show up as bad, you're going to be able to be more curious about it. And when you get more curious, you can start to A, understand yourself a little bit more, but you're also going to have a bigger, better understanding of how other people move through the world and what you need in order to stay and remain securely attached to them. So getting curious allows for exploration, allows for you to not just jump on that first trauma brain informed story, allows you to rewrite the narrative. And all of this is going to come up in the situations that you encounter in your regular everyday with your close partners, with your close friends, your more distant sort of co-workers or your more distant friends. All of this is going to be information for you to explore and to look at. The purpose of this episode today is to put those topics on the table for you to consider and for you to think about as you start to organize where you're at in your own relationship health, how the relationships in your life feel comfortable for you or don't feel comfortable for you, and how your behaviors in relationships are working for you. If they're moving you toward a more secure, trauma-informed relationship or if they're moving you away. Because ultimately, what a secure relationship looks like is going to be different for everyone. It is not going to be a bunch of people kumbayaing around a campfire talking and getting all in touch with their feelings. But it is going to be about saying, this is the kind of connection and relationship I would like to have. This is how I can show up as my best self in relationships. What kind of relationship are you looking for? What do you need in a relationship to feel like somebody you can stay connected to? How can I help you feel safe and secure in this relationship? Again, there's language around that. There's jargon around it. It doesn't have to be this serious, we need to have a talk talk, but it does need to be put on the table. My bias here is that if you're coming to this show with a history of narcissistic abuse, you're coming to this show with a history of broken relationships. Your trauma brain has largely been running the show in how you act in relationships, how you show up in relationships, how you choose relationships. So all of this needs to get set out loud so you can rewire your brain for healthier, more secure, more trauma-informed attachment. As I talk to you about all of this, I'm wondering how many of you are feeling in your body an increase in anxiety, feeling like kind of heat in your body or like your body is on fire or feeling like you have this frenetic need to start scanning the room and scanning your relationships for proof positive of how you show up or how you don't show up. Conversations like this are incredibly vulnerable because it means putting yourself out there in front of someone else to perhaps be hurt, to be let down on, to come into a relationship with expectations is really vulnerable because the first thing that can happen is your expectations aren't met. You can start thinking about how you're going to establish safety or more clear communication with someone and they can decide that's not a conversation that they feel safe or secure and having, and then the whole thing goes bottom up just as you're starting to set the table and get used to it. The anxiety and the anxious response and that nervous, hypervigilant fight, flight, or freeze, it's totally normal, particularly for women who were raised by narcissistic mothers, particularly for anybody who had early childhood trauma in their lives. That hypervigilance, that anxiety, is your brain trying to protect you. Remember what I said at the beginning of the episode, that you are pre-wired right now for protection. And having a better relationship with yourself is really important. Learning the tools and dynamics and strategies for having better relationships with other people, also super important. 
getting a handle on how your body reacts to things so that you feel more confident in how you react and how you respond to things that you're either feeling on your own in your own relationship with yourself or that you're experiencing with other people, also super important. And that is what we're talking about in the next episode. I'm going to be diving in deeper to the role of anxiety and trauma response and narcissistic abuse recovery and how you can start to get a better handle on it, feel more in control of it, and be able to rewrite your narrative around yourself and your relationships with other people by having more control over the anxiety that sometimes I imagine feels entirely all-consuming. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm already looking forward to that conversation next week. Bye for now. If you have a comment or a question about the show, I really do want you to send it my way. Heather at daughtersnpd.com is the way to find me. That email address is also going to be in the show notes for you. You're welcome to attach a voice memo with your comment or question. You're more than welcome to do it. In fact, I would love it if you did it. I'll keep everything anonymous unless you don't want me to because I think sometimes speaking our truth and attaching our name to it also has value. However you want to show up on my show is how I would want you to show up for yourself because here's the thing. My dream for this show is that it becomes something that's so much more about you and your needs and your questions and your concerns than it is about me. We can partner together and make this an advice show where you're the expert on you and I offer my trauma and recovery experience as along with my expertise and mother-daughter relationships. And together, I really do think we can build the community of daughters joining together to recover from narcissistic abuse. I really appreciate you tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or follow it on your favorite podcast app. If you know another woman who needs this show and its conversation in her life, I really do hope you'll consider sharing it with her. Your feedback is going to help me build the show into what we need it to be. I'd really sincerely, truly love to hear from you. You can also find me and connect with me over on Instagram at Daughters NPD. Until next time, take care of you and know that I'm in it with you. Thanks for listening to Mother Mayhem. Bye for now.